Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Gillard here. Welcome to Palmer. This is the week number one, day number one, actually, class number one of spring of 2020. And we are starting off with embryology. Pretty tough subject. Unfortunately, not the most exciting subject in the world, I don't think. <clears throat> I think medical school, physical therapy school, chiropractic school, they all put this first quarter I think just to kind of get done with it but it's actually really important if you're into anatomy because it's the root of anatomy and we find out where where things especially in terms of pathology we find out where how disease some diseases occur gastroschisis um, phallocele ectopic cordis things like that uh, patent foraminal volley might have heard of that one uh, but yeah, this is the base of, of everything. So, yeah, so we'll try to get through this uh, the best we can. And here we go. Now, I built this program from scratch a couple quarters ago. Uh, it's really a tough subject to learn. If, you, if you've ever tried to study this, if anyone's ever tried to, had this class before, it's tough for professors. One of the reasons is the books are really uh, disappointing. They're not referenced, any of them. They don't often agree with each other. And so none of them are great storytellers. So I literally had to read uh, all these books. Uh, and I mean, it's still a work in progress. I think this is my third quarter or fourth quarter teaching this. Can't even remember, third quarter or so. Uh, but I got a pretty good story put together. What I'm trying to say is it's pretty tough for you to go out and buy an embryology book and try to read this stuff on your own. You don't have time to do that. You guys are studying machines, right? That's your job is to study, memorize, you're memorizing machines. You don't have time to research and put things together yourself. So and that's one you, thing you'll find about my PowerPoint slides. I give you my teaching slides, which some professors don't do. Uh, some professors prefer you take notes and give you bullet points. You don't have time for that stuff, so I just give you my slides. And we'll talk about testing. We're going to meet at 740 here. We'll talk about some of the class aspects. So, But anyway, if you would pick one book, if I could only pick one book, it would hands down, it would be this one by Carlson. Um, unfortunately, it's not one of the chiropractic board books. You're going to be tested in around sixth quarter, give or take, uh, boards, part one, you have to pass. And I'm actually a member of the test writing committee. This is my second year. They fly me out to Colorado and I write board questions. So I have quite a bit of knowledge about this. And you cannot write a question unless it comes from their reference list of books. So there are two books. The reference list are Langman and Moore's. So I've been very vigilant when constructing this, uh, this lecture series about making sure that I tell you what Langman and Moore's have to say. Most of the time they agree. I'd say probably 80% of the time, 85% of the time uh, with Carlson, which is the most evidence-based book. He's the best storyteller. The number two favorite book would be Langman, which is one of the board books. Uh, so he's just not a very good storyteller, and it's choppy and some irritating things that, uh, that he says. Uh, but anyway, it's in the 14th edition, so... Uh, if you have to buy one book, if you got the type of student that's got to buy something, then this is the one to get. By the way, too, usually when we're in class, this is a two-hour class, uh, we take a, a break between class, and then I answer questions when I come back, and uh, we kind of stretch it out. Uh, so I'm not going to do that here. I'm going straight through, uh, so this is not going to be a two-hour lecture. All right, YouTube resources. So before I gave my first class, which I think it was back in last summer, I actually built a YouTube lecture series that contains probably 80% of the material. I've, uh, one thing you'll learn about me, I'm constantly changing my slides as I learn more and as I study more and uh, as the board book ch books change, I'm constantly manipulating the slides. So we've, we've come quite a ways from these first lecture slides. They're very popular on YouTube as you'll see. Uh, uh, but they are up. Here's the link to them. You go to my channel. Just Google my name Jillard 
G I L L A R D. It's pronounced Jill like the girl, soft G, not Gill like the fish. Jillard plus embryology, and that'll take you to my channel. Okay, it's so just some general information, but kind of fun facts before we get started. When does it when does it all begin? Fertilization is the start of human development. And fertilization is actually a process we'll look at today. It's not a one single thing. It's a couple steps make up the make up fertilization. Uh, and occurs when the oocyte it's pronounced o a site, not oocyte, oocyte, or you could call it the ovum or the egg. That's the female gamete uh, that gets uh, fertilized by a sperm. A sperm invades it and the two pronuclei melt together. <clears throat> Fertilization is complete at that point. I'm sorry I got a little frog in my throat here <clears throat> this morning. So I'm gonna I'm not gonna have time to edit this stuff out. I'm gonna take a sip of water. <clears throat> Okay, fertilization uh, sometimes is called conception. It's AKA for fertilization. So another fact, human development. You can divide it up into two time points. We're focusing definitely on the prenatal period before birth and postnatal period would be after birth, but we're focusing on the prenatal period. Another word, gestation. That's incubation time. Gestation is the period from fertilization after the time fertilization is complete to the time of birth so that's like the cooking time right the mom's uh, cooking the bun in the oven prenatal period can be split up into some things now when you see these stars that means I've made a test question I try to remember as I review last night I reviewed these slides I always review before I present and if I remember oh yeah I made a question on that I'll put a star here and your fifth, by the time you get in fifth quarter, I kind of went wow with my my stars. Uh, but <clears throat> for you guys, you see a star. This is a good slide. It's easy for me to make a question with this slide, right? There's a lot of easy information. But so the prenatal period is uh, split up into three trimesters, and the trimesters are simply months one through three is the first trimester most critical stage of development a lot of mutations and damage and birth defects occur sometimes that's before the mom even realizes she's pregnant second trimester f months four through six third trimester months seven through nine and you could also divide up the prenatal period into two pieces if you want the embryonic period which is week one through eight and the fetal period, which is week 9 through 40. You can even split the embryonic period uh, by subdividing that into a neonatal period. Some authors say week 1 to 4 is the neonatal period uh, within the embryonic period. Okay, we've got to know a little bit about this word. This is called tear. Uh, like dal tal teratal uh, g teratology uh, so that is a subspecialty of embryology and pathology it's concerned with environmental or genetic factors which disturb normal development what does that mean that's a fancy way of saying that is those are birth it's the study of birth defects okay teratology is the study of birth defects a little epidemiology, some fun facts and birthology. It's the number one cause of death in infants. Uh, specifically, it's the cause in about 20% of all infants uh, in the United States, according to the CDC, Center for Disease Control. Uh, it's found to some degree in about one out of every 33 births. So, in other words, 3% of births that's a huge number, right? 33 or three percent of births have some type of of birth defect. A lot of them aren't noticeable. Might with a heart, maybe a patent for amino volley or something like you have no clue. You could go your whole life with some of these. Uh, Meckel's diverticulum comes to mind. 
can go your whole life and never know you have them and they won't affect your life but it's a pretty big number so uh, lots of stars in this slide uh, specifically by the ones they want you to know so these are the birth defects uh, and a lot of these we'll talk about in the fifth quarter we'll talk about congenital heart disease diaphragmatic hernia we'll talk about this quarter esophageal atresia gastroschisis this quarter that's fifth quarter neural tube defects this quarter I'm follow seal this quarter uh, so really easy for me ma to make a test question out of this right you can see uh, which one of the following is not a specific birth defect and I could say I, I, I write board style questions to get you used to it so there's only four multi they're all multiple choice right on the boards no true or false just a lot of fill in the blanks all of the following are birth defects except blank and then I could list them all out and that makes some strange one macrocephaly not microcephaly could be a false answer that's kind of kind of how I roll on some questions my tests are are challenging to some students so this is an important slide some of you may know this is probably it's always a couple kinesiology people are pretty good at this stuff but embryology will challenge even you veteran kinesiology people uh, so which way is up so there's superior means up toward the head another way to say it is cranial we're going to lose use cranial and cephalad a lot rostal some authors use it to mean superior it's really used by neurologists and people who study neurology it means more front toward the front of the brain uh, than anything else but some authors don't really use it correctly so watch out for that one anterior and ventral if you don't know the word ventral you better memorize that one because I use that interchangeably aka for anterior posterior is aka for dorsal then we have inferior or toward the bottom caudal uh, is tail toward the end now the trouble with embryology is we're going to start out with a flat a little flat bilaminar disc to make the human to make this thing is that what we're going to make in fact this is about all the farther we're going to even get in the class it's incredibly complicated to build this the trouble is uh, during week four the flat little little human here folds and that switches everything around so some authors ignore the folding and still name things cranial up here some name it cranial over here some switch to rostral so it can get really confusing <clears throat> but we'll get through that in accord with the board book so you're on point with that stuff another concept uh, are planes so just because let's look at this the sagittal plane so if you were to take uh, this little doll right here, we'll say, we'll take a knife and chop it down the middle like this into two halves. This plane, this is a mid-sagittal cut, uh, or a median sagittal cut, you could call it, or mid-sagittal cut. But it's a cut kind of chopped right down like this. But the confusing thing is you don't look at a, a mid-sagittal cut like this. How do you look at it? You look at it you look at it uh, to to view it you look at it from the side so you have to go around to the side to look at this I'll show you in the next slide what I mean by that but for right now mid sagittal means that you get you chop the little doll here from the uh, from the front a horizontal and this is always confusing there's four aka's for this um, chat you could actually make this chat here oh I can try my drawing tools out let's see how they work chat so that's the mnemonic cross-sectional horizontal axial transverse you need to know that one right now for anatomy and throughout this school because different for example uh, if you're in radiology they never use horizontal transverse they always use axial for embryo or for radiology when you're talking about embryology they always use horizontal or cross-sectional uh, anatomy sometimes uses transverse they're all a cut like this so if this is a tree a lumberjack kind of sawing the tree like this that's a cross section 
but you view that one from overhead right you don't view it from this position I'll show you that in a second and this is a frontal or a coronal cut uh, so you stand on the side of the little doll and you cut down like this okay so it's important to understand these cuts but it's important that once you make the cut we have to view the cut and you don't view the cut in the same plane of the cut right so here's a, a picture of the brain here's a horizontal cut I'll use horizontal because we're in embryology uh, but you don't view it like this you have to get overhead or you could go underneath and view it from underneath in fact uh, these axial views are on MRI and CT they're viewed from underneath so the right and left sides are reversed a coronal view you have to view from the front or you could view it from the back even though you don't cut it like that and then a, a lateral or sagittal view is a cut from the side you have to view that from the left or right side see how that works so that's an important concept to know proximal or distal so proximal is a further point or a, or a closer point when you're talking about it's probably easier to do distal this means distant so this is a point more away from the midline of the body perfect example if you look at your arm your wrist is distal to your body so you have to give a reference point. The reference point is your elbow. Where's your wrist in relation to your elbow? Is it proximal or distal? It's further away, uh, so it's distal. If you say your elbow in relationship to your wrist, is your elbow proximal or distal to your wrist? Well, it's closer to the midline of the body, so it's proximal. So the midline of your body is the, the, like a mid-sagittal cut right down the center through your chin and belly button. Okay, <clears throat> same with muscles. You can use that with blood flow. So the blood flows proximally to a reference point. Uh, let's, say the, let's say the scaling triangle where the subclavian artery comes out and your blood is flowing down towards your fingers. So the blood is flowing downstream is towards your fingers you could say the blood flow is proximal okay distal you could say the blood flow uh, I'm, I'm sorry proximal would be upstream from that uh, so and and I need to give you an example so you understand that so let's say someone has thoracic outlet syndrome and they developed an arterial blood clot in the subclavian artery oh I can draw let's that's right let me get my drawing tools here Okay, so let's here's a here's a tube. Let's draw let's draw a blood vessel. Okay, here's the heart right here. This is why I do PowerPoints because I'm not a great drawer. All right, that's the subclavian artery. Let's say we got a blood clot right here, and the blood clot breaks loose and becomes an embolism which way is it going to flow? Well here's this is the hand out here. Well the blood clot's going to travel this way. So which way does it travel? It travels downstream to the river flow. So it travels distally to the block. But part of, let's say then a little bit later it starts to really clot up and it becomes a beaver dam. And you're trying to get blood flow through here and you can't so the blood starts to what back up just like a river right and stretch everything out so the backup of blood uh, is would that be distal or proximal it would be proximal to the uh, occlusion there so that's an example of that we'll talk about that a lot in fifth quarter uh, gametogenesis Okay, we need to talk about that. So that's the process of forming the gametes. What are gametes? Well, those are sex cells. Right? That's the sperm and the egg, or the oocyte. Where do gametes come from? There's a precursor to these sex cells, or gametes. Uh, these are called germ cells. People get these two confused, gametes and germ cells. They both start with G, but they're not the same right these guys are what these germ cells are are 2n 
right? They're diploid. These guys, gametes, we know are one n. You've had this before somewhere, I hope. I'm not going to dig too deep into it. So these are the parents. They give rise, germ cells give rise to gametes. Uh, there's two types of gametes, as we said. Uh, there's the oocyte and the sperm, or the spermatozoa. What's the process of making an egg? That's called oogenesis and the process of making a sperm, spermatogenesis. Oogenesis, spermatogenesis. Okay, these are the two types of gametogenesis. Gametogenesis is the parent term. There's two types of gametogenesis. Oogenesis, spermatogenesis. Everybody got it? Good. Germ cells, are they diploid or haploid? Well, I kind of just told you. But remember, these are precursors. Uh, so they, they are still 2N. What does that mean, diploid? That means that these cells, if you take a cell apart and you look at it in an electron microscope and look at the, the DNA and the chromosomes, there's 46 chromosomes. Uh, specifically, there's 23 pairs of chromosomes, homologous chromosomes, that match each other. One came from mom, one came from dad. So, I've got it. They are diploid. They are not sex cells. Sex cells, the gametes, are going to be haploid. But the germ cells are diploid. Somatic cells and sex cells is so when we talk about 46 chromosomes, 23 of them are, there's two pairs of them that are the sex cells. They're all 2N except for one. The sex cells, uh, the sex cells are haploid. But the rest of the somatic cells, the body cells, are diploid. That's what I'm trying to say. Remember your basic genetics. Body cells always have one set of chromosomes. Uh, from mom and one set of from dad. Somatic cells are therefore diploid. The sex cells, however, have one set of chromosomes. And therefore, they are haploid. Okay, germ cells. Who are the germ cells? The germ cells, I, we don't know this. So remember that's the germ cells are they are going to give rise to the G gametes. So these are like the parents of the gametes. Well, the primary oocyte in the female, we're not going to look too in depth at this. I haven't put that in yet, but I did. I have put in uh, looking at spermatogenesis. We're going to look at that one. And the germ cell is the spermatogonia. We'll look at the two types of spermatogonia. Uh, let's see. And again, there are two N, uh, so one gives rise to four sperms. We'll go through that. Sorry, I had a little water. My voice has got a long way to go. Let's look at spermatogenesis. So here's the parts, right? The male reproductive system. We have a penis. We have a scrotum, which contains the testes. Uh, the, the testy has a little caterpillar-like thing on top of it called the epididymis. This is where sperm, sperm are made inside the testes. We'll look exactly, actually we'll look here in a second, but they're made here. And they're stored in this little caterpillar, epididymis. And then the male ejaculates, uh, reaches orgasm. This contracts and squeezes the sperm out of here, and the sperm go through this tube, fallopian, or the vas deferens, and it's not just from the power of this contracting, there is a peristaltic wave, just like in your intestine, that pushes the sperm along. Through these pipes, sperm in the middle of the prostate and the guy gets dumped in the prosthetic urethra. This is where the urine comes through right here, as you learn. So that's kind of the pathway. Uh, there's seminal vesicles that dump fluid into this tube as well. So yeah, that's the pathway. And then the sperm goes down the urethra out into the vagina and the little swimmers start swimming looking for an egg. Where does, let's go back to the testes though, where, where do these sperm come from? Well, the process of making a sperm, again, is spermatogenesis. Uh, and that 
actually all the magic happens right in something called the seminiferous tubule. So if you look at cross section of a testicle here, um, this tissue, if you blow it up, there's tons and tons of curled tubes in here. If we blow one of those up, that's called a seminiferous tubule. Uh, and that's where spermatogenesis, that's where the little swimmers are made right inside this tube. And if we take a cross section of that tube and blow that up, here's a seminiferous tubule, blow that up, you see we got some, we got some stuff going on here, a differentiation process going on here. Uh, and so this is called the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. This is where the mature or semi-mature little sperm will kind of release and swim up to their epididymis. Remember the epididymis, uh, here it's right here, but the epididymis is connected to the testis. So uh, in the reet testis, there were the little channels get bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger, so the swimmers can come up to this little caterpillar and be stored here. Uh, but if we look again inside the seminiferous tubule, we can see the magic, uh, and this is what spermatogenesis is all about. Uh, we have Leydig cells here, which release testosterone, is a hormone to talk about when we get in fifth quarter. You have a little endocrinology before you reach me. But testosterone, about the age of 12 on average, you wake up, testosterone starts being secreted by these guys. It soaks in uh, to these cells and it wakes up these spermatogonia and they start differentiating. And we'll look at this in a second, how you make a sperm uh, from a spermatogonia. But that's exactly what happens. Right, so spermatogonia, they're considered stem cells uh, or the male germ cells, but they are stem cell, meaning they are semi-immortal. And yeah, they're sperm making factories. There's other nursing cells, these little cells, this little substance right here. Uh, these are called the sartori cells. You can't really, they didn't really draw it very good here. Um, but sartori cells, are nurse cells. They surround, I guess this whole thing is a sartori cell and these are kind of being nursed and chaperoned by the sartori cell called a nurse cell because it gives rise to uh, the process of spermatogenesis. And it gives the cells as they develop they need support and nutrients and it helps supply those to keep them differentiating. Spermatogenesis is Again, stimulated by testosterone, which comes from the Leydig cells. I can see the question right now. There's a star. Which one of the following statements is false with regard to spermatogenesis? And I could pick anything. One good thing about my tests, you, if, if it's not on a slide, I won't test you on it. So you don't worry if I start rambling about something. I'm not going to test you on anything I start rambling about. It's got to be on these slides. Okay, let's dig into spermatogenesis a little bit. Here's the classic diagram. I know you guys have all studied this before. But remember, this is going on within the seminiferous tubule is where this is all happening. So via mitosis. Now, this would be a good time to stop this video if you're shaky on mitosis and meiosis 1 and 2. Uh, there's YouTube videos called the Amoeba Sisters. They do an absolutely wonderful job. Uh, with mitosis and meiosis. So you might want to check that video out, get up to speed and come back. Uh, but mitosis, uh, so if you want, let's make a sperm. How are we going to make a sperm? So the first thing we have to do is one of our stem cells, our spermatogonia, uh, which is 2N, 46 chromosomes, it goes through mitotic uh, division, it goes through mitosis. And what's the result of mitosis? Mitosis is splitting. One cell splits into two. So one cell, another spermatogonia is produced. Uh, this one is destroyed. But that's okay because it's, it's like it never went away because it's remade. But a new kind of cell is made in the process. And that's called a primary spermatocyte. Um, that's called a, a reduction division. Uh, and then 
the, the, the primary spermatocyte is, well, let's, let me not get ahead. Let's just go through this. So spermatogonia splits into a, uh, into a new spermatogonia to replace it, and then a new cell called the primary spermatocyte. This is still 2N, still diploid. Each one of these has 46 chromosomes. And this is going on all over the place, right? We're just looking at one. <clears throat> OK, so the primary spermatogonia now enters meiosis uh, 1. And it splits into a new cell type. It doesn't recreate itself like mitotic division does. It goes through mitosis 1. Uh, and it splits into two new cells. These are called sperma secondary spermatocytes. Uh, and that, this is in the wrong place, isn't it? Um, I don't want to fix it. I don't want to mess this up. But this should be down here. Uh, this is the reduction division because we have just reduced the number of chromosomes in half in each one of these. So now there's 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes, 1N. So that's, boards love that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so the diploid number is now 1N, or haploid. Each one of these cells has 23 chromosomes. OK, are we good with that? All right. Now the secondary spermatocytes are going to go through meiosis 2. And they're going to split again into two. So we've taken one spermatogonia, and now we've made four uh, cells uh, out of that. So the secondary spermato uh, spermatocytes via mitosis to split into four. Now we're not going to call them tertiary spermatocytes. We're going to call these spermatids. And they're the same. They're, I mean, you can't get any lower than 1N or 23. They're still 1N or 23. This meiosis 2 is kind of similar to mitosis in a way. You don't. It's not a reduction division. That's bugging me. That's in the wrong place. It should be down here, right? That goes right there. OK. So spermatids via a process of spermiogen, not spermatogenesis, spermiogenesis, they are going to differentiate. And there's going to be no more division. There's no more mitosis or mito meiosis. They're just going to mature, kind of like the skin cells do, right? You're going to study how the skin cells start in the stratum basale uh, from a stem cell, basal cell. Uh, and they go to spinosum cells. And they go up to a flat cell that's on top of your skin now. That's another example of differentiation. There's no mitosis or meiosis involved. And pretty soon, we have a little a baby sperm here. It's not mature yet. It's going to, but it can now, it can kind of float and half swim its way out to the little caterpillar where it will mature. OK. Now, fortunately, it's not that simple. I think for board purposes, if you learned what I just said, you're going to be able to answer most of those questions. But for those of you who want to crush boards, those of you who want to be the Val Victorian of your class, we got to go a little deeper. So let's go a little deeper with spermatogenesis. And this is uh, from Ross, uh, Junkiera, which is your histology board book. They all talk about this, so it's all fair game for board questions. But these would be considered hard board questions. But let's look at spermatogenesis again. Uh, spermatogo there's three phases. Perfect to make a question, right? One of my questions. All of the following are phases of spermatogenesis except blank. Because when you see three things, it's, it's easy for me to make one up. Hence the star. But spermatogonia phase, spermatocyte phase, and the spermiogenesis phase. Let's take a look. So it's not quite that simple with spermatogonia in the real world. There's two types of spermatogonia. Uh, the first type is called a type A dark spermatogonia. These dudes are true stem cells. They never die. Uh, they are immortal. But the trouble is they don't work all the time. They're kind of a 
the father of a cell, the workhorse, which are called the pale spermatogonia. If a pale spermatogonia dies, type A specifically, pale spermatogonia dies, uh, it can replace it. So how does the type A, we'll call it the AD spermatogonia uh, for A dark spermatogonia. How does the A dark spermatogonia work? If a pale spermatogonia dies, it, kick, it turns on, it's stimulated. Uh, it creates a new AD spermatogonia to replace itself because it's just splitting in half. Uh, and then it, it refreshes the workhorse, uh, the type A pale spermatogonia. We'll call those the AP spermatogonia. So we have AD spermatogonia and AP spermatogonia. When you see the nerd sign here, that's this is like tough territory. If you're just trying to get through this program and you want to make C's and uh, don't want to stress too much, you could probably do it without worrying about this nerdy stuff. This is for these students who want to crush things. There definitely will be. I do like the nerdy questions, but it it won't be fatal to you. Uh, remember, there's no D's in chiropractic college, right? A D is like an F. You have to get C's or better to, to, to move on to the next level. So if you're just trying to get through, you know, this is the last stuff you need to worry about when you're studying. Okay, so the type A pale spermatogonia, these are the workhorses I said already, the progenitor cells. They divide rapidly into new cells, but they do die. They're not immortal. And again, they're replaced by the dark spermatogonia when that occurs. Uh, yeah, let's see. So when inactive, they divide, still by mitosis, into another type A pale spermatogonia uh, and another, or and then a type B spermatogonia. Uh, so what do they make is I guess what I'm trying to say here. So these workhorses, what do they do? They create something called a type B spermatogonia. By mitosis, I'll see, we'll see a, dar a diagram of this in a second. Uh, but they, of course, they have to replenish themselves because they're splitting, so they replace themselves. But they make something new called a type B spermatogonia. It's the type B spermatogonia divides again via mitosis into two primary spermatocytes, which brings us into a new phase. So let's take a look at all this stuff. Um, so here is the stem cell, the dark, type A dark. They're not working all the time, but these guys, these are the pale, type A pale spermatogonia. These guys are the ones dividing. And it's even a little more complicated uh, before, they, uh, before they make a primary spermatocyte. Uh, there's a process to that. But eventually, after a couple of interdivisions, and we won't get into, these guys are named as well, but we're not going to go that deep. But finally, these type A pale spermatogonia divide by mitosis, so it's, their babies are still 2N, they divide into these type B spermatogonia. These are the ones uh, that are going to create the next level, which is the primary spermatocytes. So we need to talk about that. So now that we have a primary spermatocyte, well, there's still two N, 46 chromosomes, right? Because we're still, these are all mitotic divisions still. And that mitosis, uh, that mitosis carries down into here as well. But now we have a primary spermato, uh, spermatocyte. That's going to divide via mitosis one. Right? We, we've already talked about these are the same primary spermatocytes we've talked about. Uh, so mitosis 1, that's going to be a reduction division, right? Because m once you hit mitosis, you're splitting the genetic material in half. So now there are 23 chromosomes, 1N. And what do they create? Primary spermatocytes create secondary spermatocytes. Okay, everything I said there. Now the secondary spermatocytes, uh, secondary spermatocytes, what happens to them? Well, we're moving through mitosis. Remember, there's two phases of, of my, uh, I'm sorry, meiosis. There's two phases of meiosis. We just go through meiosis two here, and that's going to 
it's kind of like mitosis, right? There's not going to be another, it's not another div reduction division. Remember, mitosis 2 is not a reduction division. Mitosis 1 is the reduction division. You can't reduce this any lower than 23 chromosomes. So anyway, mitosis 2 leads to the formation of two baby sperm. And they're called early immature spermatotids. And there's still 1 and 23. All right, so here's the second part of that. There's a primary spermatocyte. It goes through mitosis. This is the reduction division right here. Gives us two uh, secondary spermatocytes. And uh, the secondary spermatocytes go through mitosis 2 or meiosis 2. And we got our little baby sperm or spermatotids. These guys are going to differentiate. Uh, in a new phase. So this is the spermatid phase or spermiogenesis. So spermatids no longer divide. There's no more mitosis or meiosis. They're going to just mature or differentiate. Uh, and they get more mature and their little tails get more powerful. And this is happening. Differentiation happens in the seminiferous tubules, specifically in the epididymis. Talked about that already, right? And yeah, and they become a mature in about 48 hours. They become mature spermatozoa, and they're ready to be ejaculated and try to fulfill their life destiny, which is to find an egg and fertilize that egg. Not many of them can accomplish that. All right, so here's just a cartoon of everything that we've talked about so far. I'm not going to review that, but just another picture. That's one of the reasons, as I have so many slides, I love my pictures. I'm a very visual learner, and I think some of you probably are as well. All right, uh, and then we talked about the pathway already, but uh, orgasm occurs, the sperm are ejected out th through the fallopian tube. We already talked about all this stuff, um, so you can read through that. I don't think there's anything. Sperm are squeezed down through peristalsis. Remember, I said that, but it wasn't in stone, but now it's in stone, so I can test you on it. Okay, prosthetic urethra, this is kind of the tube where the urine goes. So the prosthetic urethra, uh, there's a membranous urethra here. Your genital diaphragm is where it passes through. Uh, and then there's a, a penile urethra here. And you get that in gross two anatomy. Uh, you should know that the little swimmers will mix when an orgasm occurs. There is smooth muscle, we'll talk about fifth quarter, but there's smooth muscle in the prostate gland that contracts during orgasm and squeezes juice out of the prostate. So that's prostate juice. Same deal with the semino, uh, semino vesicles. They contract during orgasm. It, it squeezes their seminal vesicle fluid out. Be careful with seminal vesicle fluid and seminal fluid. It's not an AKA. Uh, AKA for that is some you know, fluid, seminal fluid. Watch out for that word, seminal fluid. That's an AKA for semen. People get, get seminal fluid confused with seminal vesicle fluid right seminal fluid is the final product like semen seminal fluid in semen is all the juice that's ejaculated it, and that juice that comes out of the penis during ejaculation that's made of prosthetic juices and seminal vesicle juices they all have purposes we'll talk about in fifth quarter and then the sperm are mixed in there as well okay so everybody's good with that all right, here we go. So what is our goal here in embryology? Goal is to produce one of these things. We're going to go from a two-celled little creature called a zygote here, and we have to morph it into 37 trillion cells. So this is quite a feat, quite an amazing feat. So in this class, we have time to build folding, talk about uh, week four, we don't get much past week four in this class. It's only you know, two hours a week I would need 
probably about five six hours a week to really get into this uh, but this is my job is to get you through these boards and teach you the basis once I teach you all the hard stuff it's the rest of the stuff is pretty intuitive once you understand how this thing gets start this started uh, it all starts with fertilization so let's talk about it this is another great video another chance to coffee break or a little food break whatever pop this video on here um, <clears throat> it's awesome it's I don't know how they did it it's 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 a cartoon it's not quite deep enough we're gonna go deeper but it's really accurate and it gives you a nice visualization of what we're trying to accomplish process of fertilization this is a corona radiata the egg oocyte is inside here it has defenses look at the size that's a sperm sperm's got to penetrate this massive giant thing uh, and it's uh, it's quite a it's quite difficult it's quite a complicated process as you will see so in general fertilization it's just the union of the male and female gametes oocyte in the and the sperm come together uh, and they fertilization occurs it's not quite that simple as we'll see in reality it's not the sperm and the egg coming together it's their nuclei uh, and their nuclei are in an immature form they're called pronuclei so it's a melting of the genetic material within the pronuclei is the final step in fertilization I remember again gametes those are the sperm and the eggs and the oocyte there's a picture of an oocyte it's got three layers that we have to penetrate the sperm does sperm is way blown up here right we just saw what it really looks like it's super tiny uh, but we'll go through these pieces when time comes it all begins when the sperm penetrates the outermost portion uh, of the egg uh, so that's called the zona pellucida specifically if you really want to get specific fertilization starts when the sperm penetrates the zona pellucida and enters something called the perivitalin space and it intermingle or it ends fertilization is complete when the pronuclei melt together and once they melt together the genetic material the chromosomes flow and intermingle amongst each other fertilization is complete some say life has begun at that point let's look you know I'm not even keeping track I have no idea how much time I've went I don't want to crush you the first day uh, so let's see I guess we can keep going for a while um, so this is the female setup we're not going to dig too much you get this in gross to anatomy uh, but the where does the egg come from where's the oocyte come from there's quite a process so oogenesis that occurs which I'm not gonna eventually I need to get into that uh, but we're we're let we're releasing an oocyte here it's called the secondary oocyte and it's weird because it hasn't went through mitosis or meiosis 2 yet it's stuck it's stuck there uh, so keep that in mind but the little egg is released here the fimbriae of the fallopian this is the fallopian right well, let's back up more this is where the baby is grown uh, actually in the myometrium of the uterus is where our little our fertilized egg is going in plant as we'll, we'll, we'll go into that in detail but basically the during the females period uh, she or not quite period yet but she releases an egg these little fimbriae are fingers of this tube this is called the fallopian tube uh, there's an isthmus you need to know an intramural portion which is still in the uterus and then the ampulla region here uh, usually it's shown as a big bump right here but this whole tube is the ampulla then we have the infundibulum right here and these little movable fingers they're stimulated when an egg is mature and released here these fingers grab that egg and kind of coax it to come in uh, to the flu the infundibulum of the fallopian tube and then by some kind of peristalsis type movements the egg is pushed down the fallopian tube further and further fertilization usually occurs right in the ampulla here the sperm of course were injected into the vagina 
they come up through the external os uh, of the cervix, kind of a muscular region. You'll see all this in gross too. And the sperm travel this way and hopefully they meet up together here. Sometimes the fimbriae screw up and the egg gets loose in the abdominal cavity. Rarely the darn sperm can follow that thing all the way out and you can get pregnant out in your abdominal cavity. It's one type of ectopic pregnancy. Okay, here is the process of, now there's, I'm not going to test you on this stuff, but just to get ready, somebody's going to, probably Dr. Doe in histology, that's another tough class. You actually have a pretty, first quarter is actually pretty tough with all, you have embryology's tough and histology's a big class, those big classes are really tough. Uh, and gross anatomy is going to be tough, maybe not as tough as it used to be if you can't see the cadavers. I think everything's going to be, it has to be online, so anyway. Yeah, there's the system there, but there's a secondary oocyte uh, that is, uh, the corpus luteum is important too, we'll talk about that because that thing releases hormones. Uh, so we don't want it to degenerate if you get pregnant. We keep that alive with something called HCG. But anyway, there's a secondary oocyte. I won't say anything more about that. We already talked about the trip down the fallopian tubes, uh, an ectopic number one spot for an ectopic pregnancy to occur. If fertilization occurs down here in the fimbriae, the, the fertilized oocyte can actually implant into the ampulla and you can get a tubal pregnancy, which is really dangerous, right? You can rupture the tube and bleed to death. Uh, very, very painful. So you'd go into the ER hopefully before that happened. Okay, this is kind of the process again. Uh, the, the drawing's a little bit screwed up because they got fertilization occurring in the infundibulum where it should be occurring down here. But nevertheless, kind of showing you where we're headed for this. And we'll go through all this stuff. Meet the sperm. Do we want to stop here? That's one good thing about me. I write a new test every quarter so I'm not we're not like a slave to this you know it's oh my god we got to get through these slides uh, because the test is already written so I'm very flexible about that um, let's go just a little further let's meet the sperm at least go a little bit further this is the problem with me not taking breaks though uh, let's see so basic biology here so this is a cell hopefully you know that you should know the basic parts of a cell could throw a question on the test on this. Um, this is the nucleus in here. So there's a nuclear membrane that's important concept, sometimes called the nuclear envelope. And then we have an endoplasm reticulum. Uh, we have, uh, what else do we need to know? We have a cell membrane that surrounds the cell. Sometimes it's called a plasma membrane because we got to talk about hormones and stuff, how they go through the plasma membrane and they go through the nuclear membrane. Usually some transporter is needed. So that's important. And what else is important? The lysosome. Uh, we'll talk about those uh, as we we talked about vitamin B12 and how that enters the distal ileum. Lysosome is important. It swallows it. It's like a little death star if you're a Star Wars person. It destroys everything. It's like the stomach of the cell. Uh, there's the powerhouse. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Study that in biochemistry. But yeah, that's a cell. So a sperm is a cell. Uh, the cell is really here though. It's in the head of the sperm. It does have a tail that's that wiggles and powers it so this thing can swim. And there's a mid piece here. The head is where all the magic happens. There's a nucleus, a huge nucleus. Uh, so look at the parts here. We have a this very outer part. We have a cell membrane, just like any cell. Then we have something that cells don't have. We have a little football helmet in gold right here. See that? That little football helmet uh, is called the acrosome. We'll talk about that. There's some magic that happens with that. And then we have the nucleus, so therefore we have a nuclear membrane. 
which we oh, I guess I could use my drawing tools huh so that's uh, it's better if I use my laser pointer maybe but that's the nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope so we got three layers right everything oh I just blew it up there for you cell membrane is in dark red acrosome that's the football helmet and then we have the cell membrane or the nuclear membrane is right here and yeah genetic materials hanging out inside here waiting to get into the oocyte and if you blew this up even more which we're going to do the cell membrane actually has microvilla uh, we can draw those so if you we blew this up even further we have all these little pegs on the outside similar to the enterocytes that you'll study we'll see those blown up in a little bit acrosome is like an old school that's back when football American football started it looks pretty much like an acrosome what is it it's a lysosome it's like a specialized type of lysosome because it destroys stuff it has a bunch of enzymes but there's two key ones that you need to know there's the star uh, they're hydrolytic they destroy and one is called the most important one of these is probably haluronidase it destroys and breaks through hyaluronic acid guess who's got a lot of hyaluronic acid protecting it the oocyte does uh, acrosin is the other one and these really start the process of fertilization when they're released from the acrosome so those are two important things that you need to know okay uh, let's see sperm we already know uh, it came from a spermatic gonia in the seminifer tubules we already talked about that this is kind of review stuff I don't need to talk about that's just I could probably take that slide out of there but on the sperm head now this is exaggeration there's an important receptor you need to know uh, so they're called sed1 I will just leave them at sed1 proteins so here's an example of this little red thing that's a sed1 protein what's its job well the sperm's function is life is to penetrate the egg so it has to dock with the egg it just can't bump up to the it just can't push its way through the egg it has to bind to something and it has a binding site called a ZP3 protein on the female so ZP3 is important you need to know SED1 proteins or receptors is an AKA and you need to know ZP3 receptors who cares about these things well if you're trying to have a baby and you can't have a baby why can't you have a baby uh, you might do some genetic testing and come to find out that the male has a gene mutation and genes of course via the central dogma make protein they make receptors so if you have a gene mutation for the sed1 gene uh, you, you're going to make a dysfunctional sed1 protein and it won't bind so you can't have kids uh, or if you're female and you can't get and this is just one of many examples but what if you're female and you have a gene mutation uh, for the ZP3 receptor you can't make a good receptor you can't have kids either you're you're infertile uh, so that's why you have to know these things because maybe a patient will come in and she's upset and oh they told me I have a ZP3 mutation what does that even mean doctor I don't know and then you'll you're not going to remember it but you'll go oh yeah I remember that in embryology and you can pop on the Google machine and go oh yeah yeah now I remember yeah unfortunately one of the receptors on your egg can't dock with the sperm and that's the problem uh, some fun facts about the sperm about 130 million are ejaculated uh, during ejaculation 130 million that's a lot of sperm only about one percent actually are strong enough swimmers to make it up to the ampullary region uh, so that's a huge reduction how do the sperm know where the egg is I mean they don't have eyes they can't say oh look there's an egg over there there's some sperm chemoty uh, chemotrophic factor that is released on the surface of the oocyte and 
a sperm that is capacitated is able to find it. It's like a sperm is like a bloodhound sniffing it out. Now, I have this on YouTube and some people are going, Dr. Jillard, there's no nose on the sperm. This is just a figure of speech, right? Of course there's no nose. Uh, but they're, they're homing in on this, this factor. The mechanism is unknown. Uh, but we know that the sperm can find a, a capacitated, which is a mature sperm. It can find an egg that's not even in the fallopian tube. As I said before, one that's got in the fimbriae failed to grab it and it's loose in the abdominal cavity, uh, the sperm can go out there and preg impregnate it. So there's some factor that we don't know yet, but it can definitely result in an ectopic pregnancy. All right, that's definitely enough for your brains, I think, on this first uh, week. We'll leave off on the oocyte. And okay, so email me. I mean, we have to take attendance here. Uh, so uh, I'll probably just do that by email. I'm going to meet with you in about an hour. What time is it? It's like 6.20. I'll start rendering this and get this thing uploaded. Um, but yeah, we got to take attendance the first week for sure and the uh, for the midterm as well. So I'll just probably do that by email. Uh, okay, so great first lecture, and we'll see you tomorrow for Spinal Anatomy. We have a one-hour kind of a pre-lab lecture and then the lab is just basically worksheets so pretty pretty easy to do all right see you tomorrow